Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 14.4 on organic reactions. Today we're going to introduce different types of organic reactions and we're just going to really try to be able to predict what type of reaction is going to occur based on the reactants and be able to predict both the formula and name of the product. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Organic reactions are very different from the five general reaction types that we've talked about so far this semester. Uh, if you remember, we looked at synthesis, uh, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and we know there are more specific types of double replacement reactions, for example, acid-base neutralization, and we also looked at combustion reactions. Uh, organic reactions are much more intricate and um, your products can be much more diverse uh, than what you get from like a simple double replacement reaction. Um, so all of our reactions, whether we're talking about the five that we looked at at the beginning of the school year or organic reactions that we're going to talk about today, they're going to involve the breaking and then reforming of bonds. So we're going to have to put energy in to break apart the bonds and in the case of our organic compounds we're going to be breaking covalent bonds and then energy is released as the new bonds are formed. Organic reactions tend to be much slower than the aqueous ionic reactions that we've seen. Um, like an acid-base neutralization, once we combine the acid and the base, they start to neutralize each other immediately. With a precipitation reaction, you combine the two aqueous um, solutions, and if an insoluble product is going to be formed, it happens almost immediately upon uh, mixing the two solutions. Organic reactions take more time. Um, so depending on the nature of the reaction, it could take just a few minutes, it could take a few hours, or even over a day. Um, it really depends on the nature of the reaction. And unlike our double replacement reactions where we could predict with pretty much 100% certainty what the products would be, our organic reactions um, are going to be able to give us more possible products. A lot of the reactions that we look at in this unit are going to tend to give just one product, but in reality, just due to the nature of the reactants, and there are so many different carbons for um, each of the other reactants to react with, we tend to end up with a mixture of products. Uh, again, we're going to focus on reactions that really just give you a single product. Okay, so we're going to talk about three different reactions in this lesson. And what you really should focus on is recognizing, okay, what type of reaction is occurring. And the way you can determine that is by looking at the reactants. In an addition reaction, you have a hydrogen or a halogen, I should say a hydrogen molecule, like an H2 or a halogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, remember those are also all diatomic, being added across a double or triple bond. We'll talk a little bit more about exactly what that means, being added across. Uh, the key with addition, you of course want to look for hydrogens or halogens being reacted with a molecule, um, but the hydrocarbons that we're going to look at must be unsaturated. We have to have a double or triple bond present in order for addition to occur. If it is a saturated hydrocarbon, like an alkane, addition reactions will not occur. So let's look at the simplest alkene we can. This is... Hopefully you're thinking ethene. Uh, we've got the double bond between the two carbons. When an addition reaction happens, we're going to break up one of those double bonds. And we're going to basically add in, let's say we're reacting with, halog uh, with hydrogen, instead of having a double bond between the two carbon atoms, we're going to break that, one of the double bonds, and we're going to turn it into a saturated hydrocarbon. If we were reacting with something like chlorine gas, it's the same idea. We're going to break apart that double bond, create a single bond between the two carbon atoms, and then we'd have chlorine atoms attached to either of the carbon atoms. Um, you might be able to predict, okay, the two halogens are always going to be added onto adjacent carbons. So, for example, we would get 1,2-dichloroethane, it's impossible to get like 1,1-dichloroethane from an addition reaction. They have to be on adjacent carbons. All right, so let's see if we can predict some products of an addition reaction. Let's take propene. Uh, if you want to call this 1-propene, you can, but technically the double bond always has to be starting at carbon 1, whether you put it here or you move it next door. Uh, so a lot of times we'll just call it propene. You're going to react it with bromine. Now I know this is going to be an addition reaction because I have an unsaturated hydrocarbon reacting with a halogen. 
Take a second and see if you can predict what the product will be. If you think we're going to end up with 1,2-dibromopropane, you are absolutely right. That double bond that exists between those two carbon atoms is going to break, leaving us with a single bond, and we need four bonds going to carbon. So the bromine molecule, each of the bromine atoms is going to attach to those two carbons that were originally double bonded together. So we're going to make 1,2-dibromopropane, a saturated, uh, no longer is it called a hydrocarbon, but just a saturated molecule and we'll form a halide. We can also react with H2. Predict your product. It should be strikingly similar to the halide we just made. Break apart that double bond between the two carbon atoms and replace, uh, I guess I should say replace, add in your hydrogens. So no more double bond. We have a saturated hydrocarbon, and this is of course going to be propane, which is just an alkane. Good. All right, let's move on to our next type of organic reactions. These are substitution reactions. In a substitution reaction, one atom is going to be replaced by another atom, um, and this is going to most commonly occur with halogens. For example, if I take something like methane, CH4, I'll react with bromine again. I'm going to substitute out one hydrogen atom for one bromine atom. They're essentially just going to switch places. Uh, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that as far as the reaction mechanism is concerned. But if you take organic chemistry, you can delve into that. We're just covering the basics here. So we're going to form bromomethane. So we have a bromine atom attached to what used to be a methane. And we're going to form HBr. This is just hydrogen bromide. If you take that hydrogen bromide and you dissolve it in water, then you can make hydrobromic acid. So, just to kind of compare and contrast, how are substitution and addition reactions the same? Well, in both cases, one of the reactants can be a halogen. How are they different? In our substitution reactions, we have an unsaturated hydrocarbon. We have only, I guess this is not necessarily the greatest example, as there are no other carbon atoms present, but you need just single bonds. You can't have double and triple bonds present, because if you react with a halogen then, you're going to react via um, addition instead of substitution. So with our substitution reaction, the general formula is alkane plus halogen is going to yield a halide. Now it's important to recognize that these are going to happen stepwise. We will only substitute out one hydrogen atom at a time. So if we do the same thing, we take methane and instead of reacting with bromine, this time we react with chlorine. We can form HCl plus CH3Cl, chloromethane. You might imagine that, well, I might be able to add in Pen's not working so great. Um, add in more uh, Cl2, and I could react my chloromethane with the Cl2. I could produce more hydrogen chloride, HCl, and now I can make dichloromethane, CH2Cl2. I, in turn, could react with even more Cl2. Turn that Cl2, uh, CHCl2, rather, into even more hydrochloric acid, if that's in water, otherwise just hydrogen chloride, and trichloromethane, also known as chloroform. And finally, I could take chloroform, CHCl3, react with more Cl2, make even more HCl, and have a completely substituted carbon. So now I've got the tetrachlorocarbon, as uh, tetrachloromethane, excuse me. Um, so again, this happens one Hydrogen atom at a time, we say it proceeds stepwise, um, and this is only a reaction that we're going to observe with saturated hydrocarbons, though only the alkanes. All right, our last and probably most complicated of the three reactions we're going to talk about today is esterification. Take a guess on what sort of molecule we're going to form. Hopefully you're thinking ester. It's kind of a dead giveaway, this name. Esterification is a reaction that will produce an ester. Before we get into the reaction itself, let's think about what an ester is going to look like. Um, in an ester, I'm going to have a carbon chain separated by an oxygen atom. If I leave it just like that, that is an ether. 
in order to make an ester, I have to add a carbonyl group. Uh, that is just a carbon that is double bonded to an oxygen on either this carbon right here or that one over there. Um, for no particular reason, I'm going to add in here. That is what an ester looks like. You've got a carbon chain, an oxygen atom, and then a carbonyl containing carbon chain with, of course, hydrogen atoms filling around. Uh, so this right here, this C double bondo, single bondo, is what we can think of as an ester linkage. In order to have an ester, we need this bonds, uh, these bonds to be present. Carbon single bonded to an oxygen and double bonded to an oxygen. So in an esterification reaction, our two reactants are an acid, or specifically an organic acid. We're not talking about something like HCl or H2SO4 here. We need an organic acid uh, and an alcohol. So let's take a look at a simple organic acid and alcohol. All right, just to quickly review, what's the name of this alcohol? This is one propanol. There are three carbon atoms, prop. We have an OH group, a hydroxyl group sticking off of the carbon chain. It's an alcohol and it's off the first carbon, so one propanol. Uh, we've got an organic acid over here. Its name is ethanoic acid, or more commonly known as acetic acid. I need to form this ester linkage. Esterification reactions are a type of dehydration reactions. When you hear the word dehydration, what do you think of? Uh, hopefully hydrate is making you think of water. Dehydration is the removal of water. So if you take a look at our two reactant molecules, is there any way that you could remove water and you could create the ester linkage that we talked about earlier. If I take the hydrogen off of one of the hydroxyl groups and I completely remove the other hydroxyl group, I should be able to kind of put together the remaining pieces and create an ester linkage. If you were thinking, oh, I could take this OH and this H, at this point in time, I'm pretty happy with that. If you found a way to make water that doesn't take any carbon, uh, any hydrogens away from the carbon, and they're just coming from the hydroxyl groups, that's pretty good. We don't have to get too technical about exactly which oxygen is going to be part of the water molecule. So if I remove the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group and I push them together, I'm going to get that ester linkage. That's C, double bondo, single bondo, and water. So I have created an ester. Oh, there we go. I'm just circling it again. Um, and the name of this ester would be propyl ethanoate. So I create an ester, and then I kind of make this byproduct of water that I generally don't need, but I can't create the ester linkage without dehydrating the compounds or the molecules. All right, uh, that wraps it up for today. You've got a couple of practice problems in your workbook. We're going to be building on this tomorrow and talking about some more um, organic reactions. So thank you for tuning in, and I hope you found this helpful.